on the firepower carburetor. You'll want to know about it, no matter what dealership you're working in. So let's listen in on a service manager who's been at the V8 engine school. And so I'll run through a meeting on the firepower carburetor. Later on, we'll get all the guys in the shop together. It sounds okay, Lee. But I hope to heaven you tell the boys to make sure they cover all the bases on an engine tune-up before they touch the carburetor. Oh, don't worry, Joe. I'll be sure to tell everybody to check compression, ignition, and other factors in running down any poor performance reports. I'll drive home that this carburetor, like any carburetor, is the last thing to check. Gosh, you guys are sure touchy about when you get around to the carburetor. We have good reason, Tony. Carburetors have been blamed too darn often when performance wasn't up to snuff. You're so right, Tech. Now, fellas, let's assume that you've checked everything else. Finally, you decide that you've got to work on the carburetor. So let's consider some adjustments you can make. But keep in mind, there's no mystery surrounding this carburetor. It does the same job as all the others you've worked on. In fact, making the adjustments are the same. They're just in slightly different locations. Yeah, fellas. What you've really got here is two carburetors built into one body. Each half functions like a single carburetor. Right, Tech. And here's an interesting point. Like on our other cars, almost all the adjustments can be made without removing the carburetor. Naturally, some adjustments have to be made on the engine. For example, the engine idle. As you know, two adjustments are involved, speed and mixture. Set the engine idle speed at 475 to 500 RPM. Use a tachometer for accuracy and have the gear shift lever in neutral. Then secure the smoothest operation by setting the two idle mixture screws the same way as you would on any carburetor. Yeah, Lee, but when you wind up, both mixture screws ought to be within one-eighth turn of each other for best engine operation. Well, that shouldn't be hard to do. You're right, Joe, it's easy. Now, the fast idle adjustment is one I want to talk about next. It keeps the engine from stalling during warm-up. Again, two operations are involved, cam position and speed adjustment. To adjust cam position, you loosen the choke lever clamp screw. Then you place a 40 thousandths wire gauge between the lower edge of the fast idle cam lug and the boss on the throttle body. Hold the choke valve closed and press upward on the choke lever to take slack out of the choke connector rod. Then tighten the choke lever clamp screw. That adjusts the cam position, eh? Yeah. Now to adjust fast idle speed, be sure the engine's thoroughly warmed up and the tachometer's connected. Remove the hairpin clip from the lower end of the choke connector rod. Next, crack open the throttle slightly. Hold the choke valve closed, release the throttle lever, and slip the connector rod from the fast idle cam. Let the choke valve spring wide open. Then start the engine without opening the throttle and read the tachometer. You should read 1,300 to 1,400 RPM with the fast idle adjusting screw touching the high point of the fast idle cam. If the speed isn't right, you'll have to adjust the fast idle screw. What if you can't get a screwdriver in there? Why, well, shut off the engine and turn the throttle lever until you can adjust the screw. Restart the engine, reposition the fast idle cam, and check the speed again. If it isn't right, repeat the operation until it is. Then reconnect the choke lever rod, and the engine will drop to idle speed. That fast idle speed adjustment can be made another way, fellas. But it has to be done on the bench. You'll find the story on that in this reference book. Okay, Tech. I'll keep it in mind. Now, there's another adjustment you can make when the engine is not running, but you do this after the fast idle adjustment. What's that, Lee? The choke unloader? Yeah, Joe. Now, unloading action might sound like something new to Tony, but it's something we've had before. Basically, here's what it does. If the owner floods his engine during cold starting, the unloader helps him clear out the manifold when the throttles open wide. In other words, 
The unloader opens the choke valve slightly so more air can be drawn through the carburetor while the engine's being cranked. The unloading action is controlled by the lip on this throttle lever. And Tony, remember that you adjust the unloader after you adjust the fast idle cam position. Okay, Tech, but Lee better show me how. Sure, Tony. Just open the throttle wide. The choke valve should open enough to insert this 7 30 seconds inch gauge. To make that opening correct, use this bending tool to bend the unloader lip. That's all there is to that. Now you can adjust the accelerating pump without removing the carburetor. But so everybody can see it, I'll do it on that carburetor I've got on the bench. Wait a second, Lee. First, tell the boys how a carburetor is removed from the engine. Okay. You've got to drain about four gallons of water from the cooling system first. Then water won't slop into the manifold from the water-jacketed throttle body. Everything else comes off like before, with one exception. Disconnect these two water pipes, and it'll help if you loosen the fittings at the intake manifold and water pump. Now let's get back to how the accelerating pump's adjusted. With the air horn, dust cover, and gasket removed, you can see that the main pump parts are the operating lever, counter shaft, connector link, and pump plunger. Now, you back out the fast idle and the idle speed screws three complete turns. Then you can always come back to your original settings by turning in three complete turns. But right now, you need them backed out so you can close the throttle valves completely. Then check the pump connector link. If it's in the upper or long stroke hole of the pump arm, you should get a measurement of 17 64ths from the top of the plunger to the top of the dust cover mating edge. Hold the throttle valves closed and use a narrow steel ruler to check this distance. If the link was in the short stroke hole, that measurement should be 11 30 seconds. Now, if you don't get the right measurement, use this bending tool to adjust the upper angle of the throttle connector rod. Bend the rod up to increase the distance, down to decrease the distance. But be careful, me boys. Be sure that the rod doesn't touch the cover or you won't get the full pump travel. Good point, Tech. Now, any time the carburetor is disassembled or new rods are installed, the metering rod should be adjusted. Here are the rods, the lifter arm, piston link, vacuum piston, and spring. Remember that the metering rod adjustment should always be made after the accelerating pump's adjusted. Is that so as you won't disturb the metering rod settingly? Key rec, Tony. Now, check to see that the fast idle and the idle speed screws are backed out like we did before. Then, loosen the metering rod lifter arm screw so the arm is free to rotate on the counter shaft. While you're at this, check to see that both metering rods are in place on the vacuum piston link. Then press the link down until the rods bottom in the main body casting and hold them there. With the rods held down and the throttle closed, revolve the lifter arm until its finger just touches the lip of the link. Then tighten the screw. Yeah, Lee. And after that, you better press the link down a couple of times to be sure the vacuum piston works freely. The link and rod should pop back up. Right. And lubricate the counter shaft through the dust cover screw holes with a graphite lubricant. Then be sure to install a new gasket under the cover. Speaking of covers, that about covers the first half of this film. <laughs> so turn the record over and start the balance of our story on the firepower carburetor. Well, fellas, you can make a fast check of the fuel level by removing the inspection hole plug. Yeah, but be sure the engine's idling to make this check. Right, Tech. Now, if the fuel is at the bottom edge of the hole so it just trickles out, the level's okay. But if the fuel runs out in more than a trickle, the level's too high. On the other hand, if the fuel level is below the inspection hole, it's too low. In either case, the float setting will have to be checked. Here's how you adjust the float setting. Take off the bowl cover and remove the fulcrum pin that holds the float assembly. Then take off the gasket. Reinstall the float and pin. Then with the bowl cover upside down, 
Insert the gauge to check the float setting horizontally and vertically. You put that gauge under the center of the floats so the notches fit over the cover edges. The float sides should just touch the vertical uprights. If they don't, you use this bending tool to adjust the float arms. That's the vertical adjustment. Next, you see that the floats just touch the horizontal bar of the gauge. If the arms need adjusting, use the bending tool again. Incidentally, me boys, those floats got to have a minimum of 7 sixteenths free travel. You measure that from the free ends farthest from the needle with the floats in raised and lowered positions. Right. And if float travel needs adjusting, just bend the lip on the float bracket. That about covers adjusting the float setting. Now, any questions? Yeah, Lee. What are these two things on each side of the pump plunger? They're low-speed jets, Tony, and are important parts of the low-speed circuit. That's the circuit that furnishes fuel for idle and for speeds up to about 40 miles an hour. Then the high-speed circuit begins to supply fuel. Now remember that these metering rods and the vacuum piston are among the main parts of the high-speed circuit. Don't ever damage any of the parts grouped around the pump plunger. That's why you saw me lift the bowl cover straight up when I removed it. That protects those parts and the float arms. Suppose it slips, Lee, and you do damage the tip of a low-speed jet. In that case, Joe, use a quarter-inch open end or box wrench to remove and replace the jet. Also, the cover gasket's got to be off so you can get a good hold on the jet. When you replace metering rods, it's a good idea to replace both metering rod jets but be sure you use a proper size screwdriver so you won't damage the slots. Incidentally, Lee, how about explaining the pump circuit next? Okay, Tech. The pump circuit's got a plunger working in a well. It squirts an extra charge of fuel into each venturi through the discharge cluster ports. A small discharge check needle keeps the top of the pump passage primed, so discharge action takes place the instant the plunger starts down. Okay, Lee. Any tips on replacing pump parts? A couple, Joe. For one thing, be sure to put that check needle in with the point down. Besides that, always use a new gasket under the discharge cluster once you've removed the cluster. Here's another tip. See that the leather on the plunger is pliable and not damaged. It should be flared out to make a good contact in the cylinder. And when you reassemble the bowl cover, Install it carefully. If you force it, you might curl the plunger leather back as it goes into its cylinder. Here's something else. Use new gaskets throughout when you're putting that carburetor back together. And tighten all screws so there won't be any air or fuel leaks. Say, nobody mentioned those main nozzles? Forget about those, Joe. The main nozzles are built in and not meant to be replaced. If their tips ever get damaged, you'll have to replace the whole main body. Now, here's a point. You make this metering rod replacement after the bowl cover's been installed. First, you've got to be sure those metering rod discs are in place. Then you slide the end of the rod into the hook of the metering rod spring. Slide the rod through the disc and down into the jet. While you do that, hold the eye of the rod parallel to the piston link. Push the link down. After this, Use a small screwdriver to turn the eye so it will slide over the arm of the link. I get you, Lee. That brings us to the choke circuit, right? Yeah, but you've seen enough of the choke to know pretty well what to do. However, let me remind you to make sure the choke housing is fastened securely so cold air won't get inside. Yeah, Lee, and I'd like to repeat this service tip. Don't forget to hold that choke housing fitting with one wrench whenever you loosen and tighten the heat tube nut. Right, Tech. And when you're ready to install the air cleaner, locate it to give plenty of clearance over the choke housing and tube. That way you won't be apt to break the housing. Okay, Lee. Now, what about those two transmission controls on the carburetor? Well, Joe, those transmission controls don't actually enter into carburetor operation. But you fellows ought to know what each one does and how they look inside. Take the kick down and limit switch. It completes the circuit to the transmission solenoid for downshifting when the driver wants to accelerate quickly. 
to pass another car, for example. Inside the housing, there's a kick-down switch, push rod, a limit piston and spring, and blocker plate. How does it operate, Lee? Well, when you drop down on the accelerator pedal, which opens the throttle wide, an actuating lever on the throttle shaft shoves the push rod in. The push rod, in turn, closes the switch, completing the circuit to the transmission solenoid. That lets the downshift take place. There's a passage above the limit piston leading into the Venturi. Air rushing through the carburetor creates a vacuum in that passage. At speeds about 45 miles an hour, the vacuum is great enough to raise the piston. This lifts the blocker plate attached. If the throttle is opened wide, the blocker limits the push rod travel and keeps it from closing the kickdown switch. That prevents the transmission from downshifting at higher speeds. Now, that dash pot keeps the engine from stalling when the accelerator is quickly released below the transmission's governed speed, about 15 miles an hour. Above 15, the dash pot doesn't enter into throttle action. Inside the dash pot is a diaphragm, magnet, plunger plate, and plunger spring. The housing also has a sealed-in ball check in its air passage. In the plunger of the diaphragm is a very small metering pin. Yeah, and if you take the plunger out, watch that pin. It's easy to lose and twice as hard to find as a collar button. <laughs> right you are, Tech. Now, below 15 miles an hour, the dash pot magnet's energized. This pulls the plunger plate down and lets the ball check seat. When the throttle closes toward idle, the plunger's pushed in. The diaphragm forces air trapped behind it through the small passage in the plunger. This restricted airflow slows up the plunger and eases the throttle slowly back to idle. What happens above governed speed? Well, above governed speed, the magnet's not energized. The tip of the plunger plate keeps the ball check off its seat. That allows free air circulation around the diaphragm, and the throttle closes freely. Now, you'll find that how to check and fix these transmission controls is all spelled out in this reference book. That's swell, Lee. We'll be sure to look it over. This new carburetor isn't as complicated as I thought. You did a good job of making it clear. That goes double for me, Lee. And you can tell everybody that I'll be back soon with a lot of useful information. Meanwhile, you fellas better study this reference book so you'll have a good knowledge of this carburetor. Thank you.